Good morning, everybody. Um, we're recording and we'll post a copy of this video on the CDL website. This is the biweekly meeting of the UMBC Cybersecurity uh, Lab, Cyber Defense Lab. And today it's our honor to have guest speaker Josiah Dykstra, who will be speaking about myths in cybersecurity based on uh, a recent book he co authored. I'd like to point out that uh, in two weeks, uh, we will have another uh, guest speaker, speaker, Dr. Peter Peterson from University of Minnesota, Duluth, who will be speaking about adversarial thinking. And then on Tuesday, December 20th, we have a special in-person event uh, that will be a public um, presentation of the three research projects going on in the Ensure Cybersecurity Research class at, at UMBC. And we invite you to uh, join us in ITE 229 for that event. Uh, once again, uh, we will participate in the CYSB scholarship competition. We encourage students um, who are interested in working for DOD to um, apply for this um, scholarship. The uh, application is done on the DOD site and there's more information on UMBC scholarship retriever. Feel free to talk to me if you uh, are interested in this possibility. Without further ado, uh, let's give uh, Dr. Uh, Dykstra the floor. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation to come back. It's good to do one of these talks uh, once a year or so. I thought this one was timely. The, the, this is related to a book that I um, have co-authored that comes out soon. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, but this is about sort of one specific aspect of that. But I also want it to be a conversation if people want to interrupt me as we go, that's totally fine. There'll be plenty of time at the end for discussion as well, um, including if you want to talk about uh, my work at NSA or anything else that sort of is relevant there. But for the time being, let me try to share my screen. It might relaunch on me one moment. The price we pay for security. Okay. As I said, you will probably have to interrupt me. I don't know that I can see hands and things we're going along. Um, I, I believe there was a talk earlier. That I wasn't able to in Dr. Peterson's talk on misconception. Um, Dr. Sherman, can I mute you? Please, I'm, I'm not the one typing. Oh, it might be Ennis. Sorry. Yeah, I think it's Ennis. <laughs> oh, so sorry. I'm not muted. My bad. Thanks. Um, so that, that talk by Dr. Peterson, I think, was about a survey that he did. And this is not about a scientific study. I will give you that caveat up front. Um, but it is about a whole one of the many topics that we were thinking about when we were writing um, the book and sort of thinking about misconceptions from our experiences in cybersecurity. So this is work that I did with Gene Spafford at Purdue, Dr. Spafford, um, and Dr. Lee Metcalf at Carnegie Mellon CERT. And among the three of us, we tried to represent our experiences in academia and government and industry. And among us, we have almost 100 years of experience. So we have not seen it all. We have not done it all. But we've seen a lot of things. And we tried to synthesize that experience into lessons, learned, lessons that we have learned that seem to have persisted across all of those decades. So the talk today is as much about communication as anything else, which I think is an underrated skill for cybersecurity professionals. That is something we almost all need. Very few of us get to sit in an office and not talk to anybody, despite what some techies prefer. Uh, I have felt that way myself sometimes, but communication is a really critical skill. And the use of analogies, the thing that I'm gonna talk about today, is one area of communication that I want to focus on. Now, the bottom line of the talk is not that analogies are bad or that they are good, um, but that context matters a lot. 
and that there are times to use analogies in cybersecurity and there are times to avoid analogies in cybersecurity. So let's uh, jump into one example. Um, let me see if this will play the audio. I don't know if it plays through. The internet is not something that you just dump something on. It's not a big truck. It's, it's a series of tubes. So this was 2006, uh, then Alaska Senator Ted Stevens um, on the Senate floor said that the internet is a series of tubes and many technical people laughed. Um, I think we still maybe chuckle at the over highly simplified description of the internet in that way. And he probably didn't know or understand completely uh, the intentionality of that analogy, but it doesn't mean that it was a horrible statement. Um, we as technologists understand how the internet works, but his Senate colleagues, the people that he's talking to, are not technological experts. And so it might not have been a bad starting point. As I said, good analogies depend a lot on who is your audience, what is their level of knowledge and education, and what are your goals in that communication? Um, that requires more than just preparing um, your remarks, your documentation, um, it requires knowing who the audience is. And that is something that I've had to learn in my experience is speak to the audience. Um, if I give this same presentation to the Chamber of Commerce in Annapolis, I will explain this concept very differently. Um, but I know that you are all technical people. And the reason that I'm going to frame it the way I do today is to help you be the best that you can be um, in your cybersecurity careers. And again, the internet. So um, this is work that I did outside of my government job. I'm happy to talk about this later, uh, but it doesn't mean that the government supports or does not uh, any of the things that I'm going to say today. And I do again want to give thanks to Dr. Spafford and Dr. Metcalf um, who helped develop these ideas and, and the book. Um, and who will continue to do training with me in this area. So because you knew the topic, you probably have had a little bit of a chance to think about analogies in cybersecurity. And I would encourage you to keep thinking about them. And after this talk, pay attention to them uh, as you sort of go about your, your day and your life. I have noticed more than I ever expected. I certainly sat down when I was doing writing on this topic and tried to enumerate a lot. But the more that I just listen and watch and look around, the more that I see. Just being here on this call today, we can probably, in the moment, the act of being on, on the webinar, we are connected in cyberspace, right? An analogy for a physical place. We are using cloud technology. Uh, cloud not is in the figurative literal sense, uh, but as a metaphor for abstraction. We, as technology people, understand that this internet connection is made possible by a three-way handshake. Again, a word that we have adopted from the physical world to describe something in our own realm. Um, if you're connected in a browser, there's probably a lock icon, right, to denote keys and locks. Um, there's a seemingly endless, rich uh, vocabulary of analogies that we use in cybersecurity that are sometimes quite helpful. Um, particularly when people are new to the topic, even when you might have been a very smart technical person when you went to, to UMBC, but when you're learning new technology, you're learning about um, the OSI layers. Um, there, it, it can be helpful to help teach and explain complicated topics, at least in the beginning, using an analogy, something that people can understand. This is one way to communicate with our peers, and that's certainly um, a way to communicate with non-technical lay audiences. I think another reason that these are so prevalent, honestly, is because humans have more and more limited attention spans. Um, I see this pop up, especially in the media, where they're trying to explain some complicated cyber attack uh, in a way that their audience won't gloss over and tune out from. And so they pick these sort of short, snappy headlines um, that catch people's attention, that generate clicks on news websites um, and drive advertising dollars. Um, they are incentivized in a lot of ways, I think, to oversimplify. Not only that, but the, the people on TV, the people writing news articles, 
usually don't have the technical insights to explain some nuance of uh, encryption, right? And so they can use locks and keys as a shorthand uh, to explain sometimes complicated topics. That can be fun, that can be good and it can be bad. Um, and those are the two distinct areas that I want to sort of point out as we go through some examples. So I, I call this a slippery slope, and that's a phrase that I will also come back to in the end because it is itself an analogy. Um, what I want to avoid at all costs is causing damage with the use of analogies. Um, I am worried that sometimes we use metaphors and analogies deliberately to deceive. Um, I don't think that is terribly common in the technical world, but I think it does happen in um, norm setting and in politics and in policy. Um, and so the use of the analogy can lead to it becoming reality. Um, think about cyber weapons. Um, working in the Department of Defense, I hear a lot about um, cyber bullets, cyber weapons. Uh, even though the analogy there is very imprecise. And those two things can cause the cyber outcome to become its analogy without meaning so. So even though there are no known examples of cyber weapons having the same kind of physical destruction as a kinetic weapon, um, this is something I wrote about with Chris Inglis, who's now the National Cyber Director, that there are similarities and differences in the language that we use, and the military should be very careful. We don't want this to become normative. Um, and so that imagination of the analogy can become reality. That's one of the things that I'm trying to avoid. Okay, so there, yes, there's analogies galore. And I'm going to talk about four sort of categories of things and a single example in each one. I certainly have more and we can delve into any specific ones if you want. Uh, again, in these examples, I wanna talk about both the pros and the cons. Not that you shouldn't use them or you definitely should, but again, the context is the thing that is absolutely essential. So let's start with the physical world. Um, these are one, these, these are the kinds of analogies that pop up everything from firewalls to keys, like we've already talked about. One that I think is problematic is this notion of the weakest link, that there is a chain um, of components or people or technology that produce security. And it is often said that the human, which we often mean users to be the weakest link, uh, cause this chain that is otherwise impenetrable, uh, apparently, uh, to fail. I think there is some benefit in this analogy because it does illustrate that there are many variables. Uh, there are many interlocking pieces. I don't know that it's a one-to-one -one chain kind of construct, but there are many things that make security work or not work. Whether the technology is robust, whether people have training, whether the developers are trained, whether we consider our adversary sort of threat models. All of those variables do matter, and any one of them could become compromised. No doubt about that. Um, everything has a dependency of, of some kind or another. The trouble is the oversimplification to say that end users are the weakest link is really unfair. Um, they are not the only people in cyber. All the people in cyber have human limitations and weaknesses, from software developers to system administrators, um, to senior leadership making decisions, to our adversaries who are also humans. And I think systems, uh, digital systems have to compensate for all of those people who might make poor decisions. So in my view, it's very unfair to just blame um, carte blanche users for being the problem. Um, let, let's say a user is asked to pick a password for a new website and they pick the password password. This is one of the, the top 10 most common passwords uh, across decades. And that password of password gets compromised. Somebody breaks in. Who is at fault? I would argue the user is not the one at fault. The system should never have allowed them to pick that password. That is a design failure. That is a programming error. Um, sure, the user should be trained. Yes, they should have selected um, of their own volition 
um, a different password, but the system should never have allowed it. Um, that's not a one break in the chain problem. That is many weak links, um, all of which could be strengthened in better ways. So many physical world analogies, uh, the chain is one, the, the, link, the linked chain is one. Let me turn to another area of analogies, which are medical or biological analogies. From the very beginning of the internet, we used this kind of terminology, things like viruses and worms. These are many decades old, almost as old as cybersecurity itself. Um, and there is some overlap, almost certainly, uh, in the way that infections spread, in the way that we uh, have hygiene, quote unquote, uh, to help protect ourselves. So things like viruses certainly help people understand contamination and spread and prevention, um, even defenses like antivirus. The trouble is that analogy is not perfect. Um, the digital protections are not, don't function the same way that a biological immune system functions. And so on a surface level, there is some, some similarity between cyber and bio. Um, but the more that we start to dig, the more imprecise that analogy gets, right? The human immune system recognizes new threats and it learns and it auto responds in a way that pretty much no modern antivirus can do. And so it has led to solutions that are signature-based defenses, um, which must be programmed by a human, not automatically learned. Even modern machine learning capabilities in some very advanced antivirus solutions um, still don't function in the way that a human immune system does. And so we have to be a little bit careful about revealing those limitations if it matters in context. If you're just trying to get your neighbor, your parents, your siblings to understand um, the threats against their system and how to protect against them, then maybe the virus analogy is appropriate or the cyber hygiene analogy is appropriate. I actually tend to like cyber hygiene as a way to illustrate day-to-day -day behavior that everybody should do. Um, things that are good for our well-being that prevent threats, whether that's brushing your teeth and washing your hands, or always picking good passwords, always using multi-factor authentication, always installing software updates. That is an analogy that I like. Um, I understand that it has limitations, it has impreciseness to it, but in general, uh, for the audience that I'm talking to, audiences I talk to about cyber hygiene, that is one I tend to like. But we have to be a little bit cautious uh, when we're setting policy or we're making corporate decisions um, to make sure that the audiences that we are talking to understand this is how it is and is not like biology. So that's category number two. Category number three are military analogies. I don't know that it's so true anymore, but when I was first learning about cybersecurity in 1998, 2000, um, I was taught to think about defenses um, like a fortress or a castle. And that was one way to think about cybersecurity at that time, which was there are perimeter defenses that can be very strong. And the assets are inside of a boundary of some kind. Uh, that analogy is less and less useful every day because things don't have precise boundaries anymore. Your cell phone walks around, it joins different networks. IoT devices don't live in a fixed boundary where we can just have strong perimeter defenses anymore. So I, I, I don't actually know, and I certainly hope that we're not teaching cybersecurity to be like a castle, to be like um, a castle boundary. A another one in military parlance, we sometimes, you might hear this phrase called blast radius, right? A blast radius in the physical world is the propagation of energy from something like a bomb. Um, that bomb has an immediate impact on a building, on a, on a geographical area, and the wave of energy propagates away from the actual site where the bomb fell on the ground. And we can measure that with physics. Um, what are the secondary, second order effects? Um, maybe it affects people buildings that you didn't intend 
uh, to have an effect on. Um, but that blast radius is the, the propagation of the impact sort of farther away. Now, we, we stole this phrase and we've used it for things like credential theft. Like, what is the blast radius of somebody's password being compromised? On one hand, I think the pro is that it can give us a sense for the scope of damage. People who reuse passwords are at increased risk um, because that compromised password could be used on other sites. If somebody steals my email password and I have used that same password for my bank, the quote unquote blast radius might include my bank account. Um, I don't know that people have a good sense, general audiences have a good sense for how those two things are related. So if they have this mental model of a bomb dropping and nearby things being damaged, like the physical world, they might not think, well, that is the same analogy as my email password being used at my bank, even though they are not sort of proximally geographically nearby. Um, and so I think that is the con, is that the impact of the, of the cyber attack doesn't always correspond to physical space limitations. Um, so th this one is more of a stretch. I'm a little bit more leery about using this, this idea of blast radius. Um, if I could use some other tool in my toolbox to explain that. So earlier in the year, I think th there was public information, for example, about the Russians in Ukraine compromising satellites. Um, and it was described also as having second order effects outside of Ukraine. So people who use those satellite internet systems in other parts of Europe were bystander casualties, right? They, that was a second order effect. And so somebody might have described that, I don't have an example of this per se, of the blast radius of the Russians compromising or, or trying to attack those, those satellites. I think it would be more clear to just describe exactly um, as I was trying to do just then, that the Russians were trying to go after the Ukrainian use. And because non-Ukrainians also use that system, they were also affected. I think that's a more clear example of communication than just saying, well, there was this blast radius into Europe. I think that's a, a an unhelpful way to communicate that. So the, the fourth category I want to talk about are legal analogies. And the legal world is something that I studied while I was doing my PhD at UMBC because I was doing forensics. And I ran into this in that realm too because lawyers wanted to think about new technologies, in my case, cloud computing, by comparing it to things that they knew or to comparing it to case law that they had already made rules about. So lawyers, for example, try to compare digital files to paper files. Um, they make that analogy because they understand a paper file. There have been decades of rules and legal sort of opinions about the, the protection of paper files. But if you try and use that as an analogy for digital files, it breaks down in a hurry, um, especially in cloud where one file doesn't have to be stored on one server in one geographic location. It might be broken in half. Half the file might be in one state or one country and another somewhere else. Another way that we have applied the law in cybersecurity is to this concept of trespass. And we use that to describe somebody breaking into a digital system as trespassing in the way that an intruder would walk into your home, your apartment. Now, there is a pro here, which is that that is access without authorization. In that case, we mean exactly the same thing. You don't have authorization to come into my house, you're trespassing. You don't have the authorization to come into my computer system, you are trespassing. So in that sense, we can use existing laws, they work okay in the digital realm, if that analogy continues to hold well. The downside, however, is that courts, I think, struggle to distinguish authorized and unauthorized digital access. What does it mean to be authorized? What constitutes access at all? Does visiting a website, is that a form of access? Is that authorized? Um, and so we see examples of the courts having trouble uh, distinguishing that. 
um, they have trouble determining whose computer one is accessing, who is the owner of that system, what is the scope of permission that that user has, is crawling a website different than manually visiting, under what circumstances does the owner give consent, um, and when can that consent be withdrawn. Those are the kind of things that people have thought about in the physical world, right? Do you have authorization for walking into Twitter, right? Twitter closed its doors last night and said that employees did, no, did not, temporarily did not have authorization to come in. That had been withdrawn. Um, what does that mean in the digital realm? I think that is where the analogy starts to break down and it has led legal scholars to wrestle with this. Do we need laws that are a little bit more specific or at least incorporate the, the specificity of the digital realm? And if you are interested in this, there's a really interesting paper by Lawrence Lessig called The Law of the Horse, uh, in which he talks about how there are no laws specifically about horses. And whether or not that means we need specific laws about cybersecurity or cyber in general, um, or whether general laws make sense. We could have a whole probably semester long course on uh, legal and cyber. That isn't for here or here or there, but, but these analogies certainly pop up a lot in the law. So in our writing, we tried to give examples of pros and cons to these kind of analogies, mostly to illustrate, not as an encompassing way, um, the, the positives and the negatives. It is certainly true that um, sometimes the analogies are true to the physical world. Um, and it can be helpful if you're trying to introduce someone to cryptography to say, this is like a key. If they need to know more, <laughs> um, then we have to be aware that in some context, digital keys are not like physical keys. One place that this pops out a lot, for better and worse, is in the movies. Um, how many movies have you seen where they're trying to crack a password and they get one character at a time? And they, they illustrate this on TV, like the old War Games, um, fantastic movie where you, you, you were supposed to see the computer getting closer and closer to knowing the password. But you and I know that isn't how digital passwords work. It's either all right or all wrong. There isn't a way to be 75% sure of your guess that you have the right password. Um, it makes for good television, it makes for good movies. And if people believe that's how passwords work, then it leads to some dangerous conclusions and certainly to, to incorrect mental models. Um, so I think we need to be very careful about when do those negatives outweigh the positives. Again, it might be in a single conversation, you're talking to your boss and you say, this situation is just like this physical world analogy. Um, and then you continue to say, and here's uh, more detail that sort of show the nuance of that analogy. If you were to just stop and say, look, we have a problem on the network, we have a virus, it might cause a decision maker to make a decision based on their mental models of biological viruses um, that just don't hold in the digital realm. And so whether you're on the SOC floor or a malware analyst, depending on who you're talking to and depending on the implications of that conversation, it might be worth the extra effort to sort of explain the nuance. Casual conversations with your friends, maybe the consequences are very low. So we need to be a little bit careful. So my three takeaways are, are these. One, do recognize that audience. The context to where simplified and perfect analogies with your friends is fine. The stakes are low. Um, if they misunderstand or, or whatever, the, the consequences probably don't matter that much. But the more that we use those simplified analogies, the more they become ingrained. And so the fact that we have talked in cybersecurity about locks and keys for so long, that is an analogy that would be very difficult to change. I think that one is probably here to stay. Number two is to um, refine the message based on the circumstances that you're in. Like I was saying in, in the Russia-Ukraine satellite example, sometimes there are ways to get your point across without using an analogy at all. 
If you can use a story or a personal experience or a recent event like Russia, Ukraine, that might help your audience understand what's going on better than just saying, oh, the Russians did this attack and the blast radius extended into Europe. That probably makes for a better clickbait headline than it does real, true, clear communication. If there's anything I learned in grad school from Dr. Sherman, it was to be as clear as possible. So I'm, that has stuck with me ever since. The third thing here is to respect your role. And those of us in cybersecurity have an important role, whether we realize it or not. We have expertise that not everybody has. Um, that is a form of power that we need to be very careful about um, and to make sort of ethical choices, including in our communications. So if you talk to people who make policy or you are the decision maker, um, being very intentional and deliberate about how you want to describe an issue goes a long way. Think about how many leaders talk about things like a cyber Pearl Harbor or cyber 9-11. Um, the, those really cause me to wince as a cybersecurity person because they are such horrible analogies. Um, I understand intent in those conversations to talk about catastrophic events, but it's using the emotion um, or the, the historical experience of somebody who lived through 9-11 or has family members, right, who were all part of Pearl Harbor. I, I don't think that's fair. And I don't think we should use phrases like cyber 9-11. That, that's my personal perspective there. Um, the world is a complex, complicated place. And sometimes simple messages are helpful and sometimes they are misleading. So people in statistics who are not my um, area of expertise often use this, this phrase, right? That all models are wrong, but some are useful. I think that probably has some degree of, of truth here in analogies. All analogies are wrong and some are useful. Um, so I want to leave you with two, two things. First, before I get to those, this picture on the right um, is one of a whole bunch of illustrations that Patty Spafford, Jean Spafford's wife, drew for us in the book. Um, they are meant to be sort of lighthearted. This is her attic of analogies. Uh, she is a professional artist and art educator, and we think they're great, <laughs> right? You see black hats and white hats. You see worms and Trojan horses. Um, she took an artist's approach to lots of concepts in this book. This was one in, our, in this chapter. There's another one I didn't put on the slide about um, cyber hygiene. Uh, you'll have to look that one up when you can. Okay. So I said in the beginning that we needed to be careful not to fall down this slippery slope. And I hope thinking about analogies gives you some consideration, some pause as you, as you use them and hear them, that they can be good. They can certainly help people understand this, this complicated world of cybersecurity and get them to do the right thing as long as we are careful about it. Um, I also said that slippery slope was its own <laughs> uh, kind of analogy. It is related to a different chapter that we have about logical fallacies. Um, you probably have heard this, this phrase of slippery slope arguments. Um, this is a concept we also talk about in the book, not as an analogy per se, um, but as a linguistic uh, sort of way to argue, right? It, it's a logical fallacy. And that is the kind of thing where if we say, for example, we're making the argument, uh, the company shouldn't allow people to print from their work laptops at home because they're going to print out all the company secrets and we're going to go out of business. That's, a, that's an example of a slippery slope argument. Um, it is taking some fact that you want to be true and blowing it out of proportion to show an outcome that is either unrealistic or, or not likely to happen. So uh, all that to say that analogies are just one kind of issue, one kind of area of myths and misconceptions that I think are worth thinking about in cybersecurity. And that is why we included it as one chapter in this book. Um, the book has more than 175 myths and they're broken down into chapters like analogies. But there's also a chapter on myths in malware and myths in vulnerabilities. Um, I helped write a chapter on digital forensics and incident response. 
a whole third of the book is related explicitly to humans, to people. So we talk about cognitive biases. What does that mean in cybersecurity? Um, there is a whole chapter on legal issues. Uh, and so it's a mix of technical and non-technical myths that are come up in everyday conversation that pe conversations that you'll have over Thanksgiving. Uh, we tried to make it lighthearted and easy to read. So it's not a textbook in the traditional sense, but it's meant to be a guide even for people who are not technical experts. Um, it comes out in paper book pretty soon, probably in January. There is a rough version in Safari um, or O'Reilly Learning, whatever Safari became, and you can start to see it a little bit there. Uh, we do hope it is useful for you as cybersecurity students and experts. Not, not only if you have, um, if you share any of these beliefs, but also so that you can help other people understand um, clearly where they might hold myths and misconceptions. So we're not trying to point fingers. We're not trying to accuse anybody of deliberately spreading misinformation. Uh, it's not that at all. But we do want to help set um, things straight where we have seen the persistence uh, of several kinds of myths. So we hope it is useful for any kind of audience, um, but I just wanted to make sure to throw that in at the end. So with that, uh, my slides are done, but I'd be more than happy to talk uh, further if people want to know about analogies or other kinds of, of myths and misconceptions that we looked at. The double-edged nature of analogy is well known in many contexts. For example, it, it arises in expert witness testimony um, can you articulate what is special about uh, this double-edged nature for cybersecurity as opposed to some other field? I think they probably share a lot in common. I'm not sure that cybersecurity is necessarily unique in that. Um, it's certainly the thing that I see the most because it's my profession in my life, uh, but I don't off the top of my head, know what makes it wholly unique as a field. Uh, maybe you've experienced that more than me. I, I don't have an opinion on this. Um, I, I guess my, my first impression is it's not clear to me what's special with regard to double-ed nature of analogy for cybersecurity. I mean, I think there are things that make cyber cybersecurity special, and I think the core of that has to do with adversarial thinking, uh, attention to detail, and healthy paranoia. Yeah, no doubt about it. Analogies come up in every domain, right? People who are experts in medicine use analogies for things that are not medical. Um, I'm not sure that the field of medicine has adopted quite as many diverse kinds of analogies as we have. Like, I don't know how much they talk about military style analogies or it certainly seems like legal analogies would matter to them a little bit. I don't think they probably use cybersecurity analogies to describe medicine in the way that we use medical analogies to describe cyber, uh, but I could be wrong. Richard Baldwin posted a question in the chat. How does one gain the skills necessary to use analogies to their utmost potential? That is a great question. I think reading the book <laughs> uh, is one, not, not that that is all of the answers. I think my experience has come just from paying attention to them. Um, that is probably a lifetime goal. I, I don't know that we will ever get, like everybody could say, I am the expert in uh, knowing when to use and not use them, to use the this tool sort of for its utmost potential. It, I think it certainly comes with experience. I'd have to think a little bit more about people that I think do this extraordinarily well. Um, I can certainly think of very good communicators. Um, I mentioned Chris Inglis, who, who I got to work with when he was at the Naval Academy, who's an amazing communicator in cybersecurity and has a way of explaining things that I think is almost unparalleled. But I'd have to think deeply about, does he use analogies or not? And how did he sort of learn to do that other than 40 years in the field. Yeah, I agree. His, um, people with a breadth of knowledge do have more 
options to sort of think about. I, I think if your knowledge or your experiences are more limited, you might go with what you know. And, and so the more knowledge and experience you have, that, that probably could help. You could also think about the ways in which the analogy is helpful and the ways in which it mismatches and maybe even point those out explicitly. Yeah, that that deliberateness is better than just the convenience of it. If somebody just pops into my office and is like, um, tell me about ransomware, uh, I, I might, for convenience, just pick something that is a less um, useful way of describing that. But if I'm very careful and deliberate about who is this person asking me and what are the, what do they really need to know, um, I, I'll choose my answer more carefully. Is it okay to use partial analogies, for example, to discuss public-private keys? Uh, it does contain the idea of two keys. Yeah, I think that is a better, the, the two key kind of system is more complete. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and, and that is where the lock and key, I think we maybe even talk about this in, in the writing, right, the fact that the same key that opens my the front door of my house is also the one that locks it. That isn't always true, right? In the public private key scheme that you're sort of describing. Um, but that takes nuance, right? That that is I if I'm going to try and if it's important for me to describe public private key cryptography, then I shouldn't just describe it as a padlock, right? That is an oversimplification that is just insufficient. <laughs> Yes, indistinguishable from magic uh, certainly is is a meme that comes up a lot. Hey Josiah, so this is really this is really cool the work you're doing. Um, I haven't really thought ever about the subject, but with 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 the sort of scathing critique almost of of analogies there must be some analogy you really like or or a favorite analogy that you use frequently um do you do you find that there's any analogies that actually are like strictly helpful the one that that i like the most is the cyber hygiene one uh which i think i mentioned earlier because yes it is simplistic but that is generally the point. The, the people where I use that analogy with are the ones not doing basic cybersecurity at all. And so I want them to adopt daily practice, um, things like install your updates, right? Sort of basic hygiene kinds of things. Um, the other reason that I like that is that most people understand that their hygiene affects other people, right? You wash your hands not only to keep yourself safe, but there's a sort of community aspect to it. Uh, which is an undercurrent of cyber hygiene also. I think that gets glossed over in cybersecurity too often, which is I'm going to install, uh, if I decide to install patches, it only affects me. That is not true, right? If your computer gets compromised, it will be used to attack other people. And so I like the community health aspect of the cyber hygiene analogy. And that is one in many audiences that I will go to. That's a good one. Yeah, thanks. What other questions do people have? Things that this made you think about? I will say the, the weakest link argument is so prevalent. I, I'm gonna have a real hard time getting that one to change. I would just watch a webinar yesterday from a prestigious group talking all about human weaknesses and ignoring the fact that there are more humans than just end users. That that really grinds on me. It's it's going to be a real uphill battle. What is the worst analogy in cyber you have heard? Oh, that is a great question that I haven't thought about. Um, you've given me something to think about, but I, I'm not sure. I, I'm almost certain that I've heard really horrible ones. <laughs> um, let me think on that. Does anybody else have one that they've heard that that was really awful?
we we talk about one in the book, which ironically came from a story in NPR about blockchain. Somebody was trying to explain blockchain. Again, a complicated technology that is really hard to describe truthfully and accurately. And they were saying, well, blockchain is like putting post-it notes on items um, so that you know, like Providence, you know the Providence of where they came from. And I I was like, what are they even talking about? I don't understand that at all. <laughs> that seems like a attempt to describe the nature of the ledger. <laughs> without understanding so. <laughs> what the ledger work, how the ledger works. Um, I would say, as far as bad analogies go, one that has actively had a detrimental effect is the use of, like, equating internet speeds to water pipes, because that gives companies a good excuse to uh, throttle something that doesn't need to be throttled. Yeah, that one gets used a lot, definitely. Can you say a little bit more about other parts of the book? Sure. Um, let me pull up my table of contents. So we start with very basic things, like everybody agrees what cybersecurity means. That is myth number one. And we talk about how many different definitions there are and how there's no universal way to measure how well it's going, right? How secure we are, because that is sort of a foundational problem in this field. And so somebody on the outside might say, even a CEO of a company might come to me and say, how are we doing, right? How secure are we? And those kind of questions are not good questions. And so we sort of wrestle with that. What are better questions? Um, that chapter talks all about things in cybersecurity, like the myth that the goal of cybersecurity is to be secure. No, the goal of cybersecurity is to help people do primary tasks, goals, jobs in a secure and private manner. But the goal is not to be 100% secure. And that is, some, that is a, a myth mostly in the cybersecurity field, right? We train people to achieve 100% security but that isn't the goal, right? That That's sort of problematic. And chapter two takes a similar approach about the internet. Like everybody knows what the internet means or IP addresses uniquely identify machines. Um, that is a very common myth in non-technical circles quite a bit. Uh, we talk about like the internet isn't controlled by a central body, right? There's this misconception that one person, one organization, one entity uh, manages and controls the internet. Um, we talk a little bit about how networks aren't static anymore and even point out that most people, well, companies of a certain size don't even know where their important assets are. Um, like the myth that you know where your crown jewels are. And I quote Rob Joyce, who's now in charge of NSA cybersecurity, who at the time was in charge of um, the offensive part of NSA. And he went on stage at Enigma the Usenix Enigma conference, and he said, we know your, we, the offense, know your network better than you do. And so I sort of quote him on that to say, uh, most people don't exactly know, yeah, different Rob, jo Rob Joyce uh, Sr. And we use that to sort of illustrate that people think they know their own networks and that their networks are very static, um, but they're definitely not. That chapter touches on things like cryptocurrency and blockchain and and that kind of thing. The second uh, chunk of the book is about humans. So faulty assumptions, um, things like, is compliance the same as security? Or I'm too small to be a target. Th those are things that I hear in the business world much more often than I hear sort of from experts. But I hear cyber people talk about some of these too, like Five nines is the key to cybersecurity, right? Five nines of availability will help my company. I heard this from a Fortune 500 company at a conference one time. Um, the only thing that we strive for is five nines. <laughs> um, or tech companies who assume that everybody has top of the line technology. So we talked for a couple uh, myths about the myth that everybody has top of the line tech. I saw this come up a lot during COVID, right? Where you, there were websites to sign up for COVID vaccines. It assumes people had access to the internet. 
um, there were lots of people in America who don't have reliable internet or don't have a smartphone. And when we build technology that makes that assumption, it leads to really bad outcomes. Do you provide some info about asset knowledge if the system has been attacked? Is it a myth to believe that everything is stolen? Yeah, that is, that's a nice one that we didn't cover. Um, I could see that in the next version of this book, like to the, the assumption that if my system has been attacked, all the data has been lost. Um, that's a really good one. I like that a lot. Um, there's, there's a myth that I had never thought about before that writing the book caused me to think about a lot, which is the myth that cybersecurity people control cybersecurity outcomes, that we have control, that if we put in the firewall, the network will be safer, that if we um, build secure software, that it won't get exploited. And the more I thought about this, the more wrong I thought it was. <laughs> we can do all the right things, um, and there still could be an attack. There still could be um, an outcome that we don't like. And a related myth, which is that all the, all bad outcomes are the result of a bad decision. Um, you can make all the right choices and still have a compromised network. Right? It's not that you made a bad choice. Um, but there's, I think, a broad, a widespread misconception that cybersecurity people have complete control over those kinds of things. Um, we talk about a whole bunch of fallacies. If you look this up on Wikipedia, you'll see a bunch like the straw man fallacy and the base rate fallacy, the gambler's fallacy. We give cyber examples for all those. I mentioned biases like um, confirmation bias, hindsight bias. Um, Overconfidence bias, again, giving cyber analogies for those. We talk about an area that took a long time to develop, which are perverse incentives, uh, which is, for example, the goal, the myth that the goal of a security vendor is to keep you secure. Now, that seems sort of counterintuitive, right? Isn't the goal of Palo Alto to make me secure? Um, I would argue no. The goal of Palo Alto is to make money. And their product is security, but that is not their primary goal. <laughs> um, and so we talk about what does that mean and how does it affect cybersecurity. Um, in the in the section on contextual issues, this is where we talk about analogies and legal issues, um, tool myths and misconceptions, like the more tools, the better. This is a, a myth that I think researchers fall into, that cybersecurity people need more tools. And in our research, we found that the average mature cybersecurity organization has something like 139 cybersecurity tools. Um, because they, they keep buying them, they think they need more, they never stop using anything. Um, this is my advice more and more to security researchers is integrate your new idea into an existing tool. Even inside of NSA, my analysts tell me all the time, I do not want more tools. <laughs> uh, I have too many things to manage already. I need more integration. Um, so if, if a researcher has a really beautiful tool, um, even if it's amazing, I might not use it because it doesn't work in the, in the workflow that I already have. So I, I think that's an important one. In the realm of vulnerabilities, we talk about how little we know about them, right? The myth that we know everything there are to know about vulnerabilities. Um, we talk about the myth that attackers are getting more proli prolific. That myth comes up a lot in the press. Like, look at how many more attacks there are today than there were in the past. Why is that a misconception? Um, in fact, there's more technology than there ever has been, and uh, it's not getting more secure. So the fact that there, we see more attacks doesn't mean that the attackers are more prolific um, or proficient. It just means that we th there's more activity as a natural result. Um, in the malware section, we talk about things like um, I can always determine who who made the malware, right? I can always do attribution and sort of where that falls apart. Or free software is good enough, right? Free malware protection antivirus is good enough. Um, and the pros and the cons of that. Um, I said with the digital forensics chapter, we have a whole bunch about data, like statistics. Um, 
one of my, our co-authors is a uh, sort of eager to talk about that. And then a little bit about visualizations, things like dashboards and um, the usual map of the globe that shows cybersecurity attacks, sort of why that is less than, than helpful. And the last chapter of the book is very much about hope. So it seems like we're uh, spending a lot of pages talking about how bad things are. That wasn't the goal. And so we are we're very explicit at the end to point out, here's how to make a less myth-prone world. We can't anticipate all the myths that will happen. Here's how you can sort of prevent them. General recommendations for like um, how to bust myths that we don't even know about in the future. So that sort of covers the spectrum. Well, thank you very much for uh, an interesting talk. We'll be back in two weeks with the next CDL meeting. Thanks, everybody. Hope you have a nice break. <laughs>